let's say you've got yourself a shiny new mirrorless camera for Christmas or whenever, <laughs> but you don't have a lot of lenses. And you've noticed, especially if you're in the Canon ecosystem like me, that the lenses for that system are pretty expensive. I'm here to give you some options you might not have considered. Let's do it. Kelly and you are in Wonderland. So I got to take you back first. So 2005, I just had my first daughter a few months before. I had a crappy, not too crappy, but a, a bridge camera. So a point and shoot fixed lens, but pretty good zoom lens for the time. Um, but it still wasn't giving me the pictures that I wanted. It had a big shutter lag. So I would miss those critical moments sometimes. So I decided I wanted to invest in a digital SLR, which was the thing at the time. So uh, when I was looking around, I was kind of torn between Nikon and Canon, who were really the leaders back then. And, you know, still two of the two of the big three. Sony's kind of leapfrogged everybody over the years. But uh, but anyway, back then it was Nikon and Canon. And when choosing between the two, I happened to notice that the Canon EF mount, which was what their DSLRs used, um, it was more adaptable to older vintage lenses than the Nikon was. And that's because of the register distance, which is the distance between the flange, the flat part of the lens mount, and the sensor, um, which on the EF mount was 44 millimeters. And that was shorter than every other, most every other um, film camera mount, and digital for that matter. So um, yeah, it was shorter than the, the Nikon F mount, Shorter than Olympus, shorter than uh, Pentax screw and K mount, the bayonet. So, in fact, the only thing it was longer than was Canon FD, which was kind of ironic. So, uh, what I found was you can adapt a lot of those old lenses to the EF mount, um, but you couldn't adapt FD without an optical element, a glass piece of glass that would degrade the image quality. So, that was out. But um, everything else, there was lots to choose from. So, that's one of the big reasons that I went with Canon in the first place. And my budget was pretty tight back then, so I knew I wouldn't have a lot of money to spend on lenses. So we're having that option of pretty cheap at the time, uh, vintage manual focus lenses to put on the camera to play with was pretty appealing. So um, yeah, that's what I did. And I amassed a decent little stock of vintage manual focus lenses uh, back in the day, which really I haven't used much over the last many years <laughs> since I actually did start buying good modern autofocus lenses. But they're still a neat option to have, um, still need to play with sometimes. And if you're just starting out and learning photography, I think they're an excellent tool to have in your bag because they really force you to think about focusing, um, composition, which lens to use for which job, and of course aperture. Um, they kind of take a lot of the, the things the camera does for you typically out of the equation and that, that makes it a more of a learning experience. So even if you've got money for good lenses, Maybe this is something you might like to try to play with. So I thought I would kind of walk you through my collection, some of it anyway, um, give you some tips on what to look for for lenses and how to use them. So that's what we're doing here today. Oh, and I should add that the new mirrorless cameras, since they don't have a mirror, hence the name, um, have an even shorter register distance. So on the Canon R mount, it's only 20 millimeters rather than 44. So what that means is you can adapt even more lenses. So FD is now in the game because <laughs> the FD register is longer than 20 millimeters. Um, but it does make the adapters a little bit bigger. And let me show you those real quick. So speaking of FD, this is 
an FD to R adapter that I got. All these are from Amazon, pretty cheap, like 20 bucks, 30 bucks maybe. So that's the FD one. I've got a M42, which is the Pintex screw mount. Lots of lenses in that mount um, and pretty good quality. So that's definitely one I would recommend if you get nothing else. And this one, which is definitely one I want to talk about. This is the Tamron Adaptal 2 to Canon ES, EOS R mount adapter. And you can see how thick it is. Um, and it's just a tube. There's no electronics in any of these. They're solid metal, which is nice. Um, but yeah, no electronics to speak of, and we'll get more into that and what that means. But you can see how tall it is. Um, and that's because that register distance is so much shorter. So these do add some length to your lenses, like the EF to R adapter does. So pretty similar to that. Cool. <laughs> All right. So let me show you a few of my favorites. Um, and I have more than this. I brought all primes today because I think you would really want to stick with primes. There are zooms and some decent ones um, that you can get, but <clears throat> zooms really were not as good as they are now back then. Um, so they tended to have more variable apertures, like you'll see 2.8 to 3.8, 3.5 to 4.2, that kind of thing. Um, and these were all designed before the benefit of computers really came into the picture. So um, definitely some more, more optical compromises in them than you might like, but I do have some good ones that I'll, I'll, I'll name at least, even if I didn't bring them. But I'm going to start with the M42 screw mount, Pintex screw mount. So here we have <clears throat> the Asahi Pintex 35mm f3.5. These are really hunks of metal and glass. Solid, solid construction. I want to say these were made in the 70s and 80s. Probably more 70s. Maybe 60s. This is probably from the 80s. Um, but yeah, it's clean it's tiny when i mounted this on my dslrs ef mount with really thin adapter because the register dif distance for this is only like 1.5 millimeters different <clears throat> than canon ef mount so the the adapter was just a thin piece of metal um hardly looked like anything was on the camera at all which made it a really nice travel lens 3.5 obviously not that fast um, but optically sharp at all apertures pretty good. I have not used these, I want to throw in, on my R7, which is what I brought on this little excursion right now. Um, so I really wanted to give that a try myself and see how they resolve at 32 megapixels. So that'll be part of the experiment today. So that's that one. This is a Honeywell Pintex um, Super Multi-Coated Tecomar 50mm f1.4. So in RF right now, in the RF mount, there are no 50 millimeter f1.4 lenses, which is wacky. Um, Canon hasn't come out with theirs yet, and of course they've restricted third parties. So if you want a 50 millimeter 1.4, these are some options. And obviously this is a lot smaller than what you'll get um, in the RF mount, I'm sure. And again, another hunk of metal and glass, so this has held up really well over the years, and I love it. Um, that's actually one of two 50 millimeter options that I brought, so talk more about that. Okay, still in M42 mount. Back during the Cold War, um, obviously Russia, Soviet Union, could not import Western lenses, so from Japan. Um, primarily was where a lot of these were made back then. So they made their own copies. And this one is a Helios M44-6 58 millimeter F2. And this is a copy of a Carl Zeiss lens, the Biotar, I believe. Um, and it's neat. It's got character. A lot of, and that's, that's one of the fun things about these old lenses. With the manual designs of the time, they tended to be a little less standard, a little less flat than modern lenses. Um, so this one has character. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how that works on the R7 and showing you some of that. That's a fun one to play with. Now... Um, I mentioned FD, so I've got my Canon FD, 50mm 1.4 as well. So I kind of want to put that against the Tacomar and see how the, how the, which one holds up better now that I can actually use this on the Canon uh, R-mount cameras, which I couldn't on the EF-mount. So, And that's a pretty solid, this is a hefty little chunk of glass too, so definitely interested in seeing how that performs. Um, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. All right. So the last couple I've brought are in a mount that I can't recommend highly enough. So these are Tamron Adaptal 2 series lenses. 
And that was a really neat series of lenses back in the 80s, really. Um, they came with no lens mount. So the, there was the lens. It had its own kind of proprietary Adaptal 2 mount. You would get various adapters to put on that, and then that would adapt to the different cameras. So you only needed one lens and the little adapter for your type of camera, and you could use it across you know, multiple cameras if you wanted to. So you could actually switch between Nikon, Canon FD, uh, Pentax screw mount, etc. cetera. Um, so let's see, what did, I, what did I bring here? Actually, I only brought one of these, but it's the best one. This is the 90 millimeter f2.5 macro lens in the Tamron SP Adaptal 2 mount. This thing is first of all solid as a rock. There's two versions of this lens. This is the, the first one, which is all metal. Solid hunk, <laughs> hunk of glass and metal. Um, really smooth and a long, long throw on the focus for really fine focusing. Sharp as a tack. I definitely want to see how it resolves on the R7. Only bad thing about this one, it only goes to one to two magnification, so half size on the sensor. Um, whereas modern macro lenses go to at least one to one. The new 100 millimeter RF macro goes to one to 1.4, which is really good. Um, or 1.4 times, yeah, 1.4 to one. That's what I'm trying to say. But for sharpness, for cost, this is an excellent lens. And usually you want a manual focus when you're doing macro anyway. So um, you can just set this to its closest focus distance and then you're actually moving the camera in and out to focus. So this is one I highly, highly recommend. I've actually got, this is a Takamar <laughs> lens hood that screws on the front here. I just happened to pick that up somewhere, but this is the lens itself. So small, hefty, but awesome. Definitely want to see what that can do. And then I actually forgot well, oh, let me, while I'm talking about Adaptal 2, so there's other lenses in this series that I can recommend. So they've got a, they've got a 28 millimeter f2.5, um, which actually the one I brought is another, no, this is Canon FD mount. This is a Vivitar 28 millimeter f2.5. And I brought it because it's got this nice hefty um, glass element in the front, which is a lot bigger than the Tamron 28 millimeter. So I want to see how this does. And since this is an FD mount lens, I wasn't really able to use it on my DSLRs, so I want to see what I can do with it on the mirrorless. So testing that out today as well. But back to Adaptal 2. So um, they have a 28 millimeter f2.5, which is good. It's a kind of a pancakey lens. It's pretty small. The adapter obviously adds some depth to it, so makes it a little bigger. But still, that's a decent one. Um, they actually have a 17 millimeter, and you might have noticed none of these go. The, the widest I have with me today is 28 millimeters, and that's really the widest I've got in a manual focus. They didn't really do ultra wide back then. So in the Adaptal 2 series, there's a 17 millimeter f3.5, I believe. And I don't have that one, but I want it um, just to mess with it. Yeah. Um, but some other ones, there's a 35 to 80 millimeter zoom in Adaptal 2, which is excellent um, for the time, for sure. And there's a 35 to 210 millimeter zoom, which is really cool, too. It's got, it, it's neat. It zooms one way, and if you turn it the other way, it switches into macro mode and only zooms a little bit. Um, but it does some pretty good macro work for a zoom lens like that, so that's a good one as well. Um, they make, I think there's an 70 to 200 or 80 to 200 that's okay. Um, and I've got the 500 millimeter mirror lens in that series, which was my longest lens for a long time, and that one got some use. Pretty hard to focus, especially on a crop sensor camera, <laughs> especially if you're dealing with moving targets. Um, so yeah, that one. I haven't used since I've gotten good telephoto lenses, but definitely I recommend like this, the 90 millimeter macro is excellent. And some of these other kind of normal primes are worth playing with as well. So, all right, that's the overview. Um, how the adapters work for the 90 millimeter, I would take my Tamron to EOS adapter. It's got, these lenses use a little green mark. Yeah, right there, little green dot. Uh, but this has red, you just line those up, same as you're attaching to the camera. So now this is the lens with hood and adapter. That's the, the full length of it that'll go on the camera. So let's walk around a little bit. I've come today to um, Belle Isle near Richmond, Virginia. And then later this afternoon is a neat walk around of some historic homes and buildings that I'm looking forward to, to doing as well. So I'm gonna try to give these lenses a good workout today. And let me talk a little bit about that real quick before I get going. Okay, so 
these lenses, like I said, the adapters have no electronics. The lenses have no electronics. These are totally manual. So what that means is when you put it on a digital camera, which expects to see an, a lens with electronics, it doesn't even know a lens is attached, let alone what that lens is. So it's going to register all of these. It might call them 50 millimeters. It might just say, I don't even know the focal length. It's definitely going to say, I don't know the aperture. So all you're going to get in your EXIF data is maybe a bogus value for focal length, no value for aperture, and you'll get the shutter speed and ISO, of course. But uh, if you want to keep track of which lens shot which thing, <laughs> you're going to have to kind of make notes, which is what I'm going to need to do today since I want to kind of try a lot of lenses. But the other thing you need to know, in the camera, by default, it won't operate the shutter or take video if it thinks no lens is attached. And that makes sense, right? Well, usually you're not going to want to you're going to get useless results if you're taking shots uh, without a lens. So to fix that, let me get my R7 going here. Do, do, do. Okay. Swap over there. You're going to need to go in the menu. I'm hoping you can see this. Maybe not. Um, but on the, the camera, the custom functions tab on the R7, it's on number four. Um, you've got an option there for release shutter without lens. See that? down towards the bottom. You need to turn that on. Otherwise, it's going to say, I don't have a lens. I'm not going to shoot. So that's important before you get going. Okay. Okay. Let's walk. See what we can see. So I'm going to start with that Vivitar 28 millimeter, since I really haven't used it much before, if at all. <laughs> I got once, eBay's your friend for all this stuff, of course. And uh, once I got a lot of Canon FD lenses, and this was one of them that was thrown in. As I bought it because there was an Adaptal 2 lens in there um, with the Adaptal 2 FD adapter, which I wanted in my collection. So kind of a bonus, this lens, but didn't, couldn't use it at the time, really. Uh, without I, I actually did get an FD to EOS adapter uh, with the glass element for Infinity Focus. Um, but yeah, it degraded the image quality so much I couldn't really tell if the lens was any good. So. This will be a nice opportunity. Um, and one thing too about that 90 millimeter macro, I said it only goes to 1.1 to 2, which is true. Um, but if you use it with extension tubes, you can get one to one or better. So keep that in mind. Okay. So one thing I can already tell you, some of these FD in particular has some mechanical linkages <laughs> that attached to the camera um, to kind of tell it what aperture it was set to, I think. Pretty sure that's how it worked back then. Um, but it makes putting it on the adapter a little bit tricky. It's got, if you can see, the adapter has this thing that says lock and open. Um, and that kind of moves a little pin inside that's supposed to engage with the part of the, that linkage on the lens. And it won't stop down the aperture unless that's in the right place. So you might have to, to fiddle with that a little bit to get it to work. M42, that's not a problem. Um, and adapt all two, I think. Especially if you're using the Adaptal 2 2RF mount, that's not a problem either. So there are quirks, but it's worth it. I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but I'm a fan of photographic challenges, right? Little exercises that get you to think outside the box a little bit. Because uh, with modern cameras these days, it's so easy. I don't want to say it's easy to get a good shot, but they certainly make it a lot easier. If you've got autofocus, auto metering, all the bells and whistles, especially on like a mirrorless camera, you can get complacent. So I really like to go out with a prime lens, just one prime lens. It forces you to look for different, different compositions, different details that you might not have looked for otherwise. So these uh, vintage prime lenses can be a really good exercise for that. That's why I like it. <laughs> Plus they're cheaper. So for basic tips, you're going to want to be shooting manual mode most of the time, which again is another exercise part of this uh, that really gets you to think about exposure more. So that's good. You can use the automatic uh, modes or even set your ISO to auto. Um, some of these lenses can kind of fool the metering of the camera if you're stopped down. Um, so that's why I tend to shoot in manual mode. The nice thing is with these modern cameras, uh, mirrorless especially, you're getting exposure simulation right in the viewfinder. So as you stop the lens down, you're seeing not only the exposure you're getting, but also the depth of field, which is pretty cool. wasn't like that in the DSLR days. <laughs> um, 
And the other aids that the camera provides are really useful as well. So you can turn on focus peaking in the viewfinder, which kind of tinges everything red that's in focus or whatever color you select. That's real handy. Um, they also have a focusing guide in the camera, these little arrows that align if you're in Canon. That doesn't really work with these lenses because the camera thinks there's no lens attached. It doesn't know that the lens is there and in manual mode basically so that really doesn't appear but the focus peaking helps and it also really helps if you set one of your buttons customize your buttons um, so that one of them does a magnified view in the viewfinder that really helps you pinpoint stuff too so tips here we are at the richmond bell isle dry rocks and the river the river's running pretty good but it's not too high right now so there's lots of rocks to climb on here and I'm sure doggies love it. <laughs> uh, it's one of my favorite places in town. It's, it's a unique feature of the area, for sure. The James River, the main channel is on the other side. This is Belle Isle in front of me, um, which has its own interesting history. I was actually going to walk around there, but I don't think I have time. Uh, but hopefully here at the Dry Rocks, I can get enough good stuff to show off some of these lenses. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> So, so far, I've just been using the 28 millimeter Vivitar. Looks sharp enough to me. Um, I can tell you 28 millimeters is not very wide on a crop sensor camera. It's a 40 something millimeter equivalent. So definitely not the wide angles that I'm used to <laughs> from like my 24 millimeters or uh, 15 to 35. But still, we'll see what that is. I think they look pretty sharp to me. It's hard to tell on the camera, so a lot of these I won't really be able to tell image quality for sure until I bring them back home and get them into Lightroom, but um, that'll be fun too. So now I'm going to switch, I think, to... I'm going to give the 35mm Takamara a go. See how that works on the, uh, the R7. So see what we get with that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was just getting some drone footage here at uh, Dry Rocks. And I noticed there was a guy who was doing, you know, some exercise on the rocks. This is a pretty popular place for the city. And he came up to me and asked if I could get some drone footage of him kind of doing some little bit of parkour on the rocks. And I'd never done anything like that before, so I uh, thought it sounded like a good opportunity. So we did that. If it came out any good, I almost hit the guy once. <laughs> I feel a little bad about that. Uh, but I think some of it was good, so uh, I'll show you that just for fun. <laughs> lens fest continues um, I got a few with the 35 millimeter but that one I've used before so it's getting a little later than I like so I'm gonna switch to the Canon FD 50 millimeter 1.4 and get a few with that um, I want to use it wide open to see how sharp it is for one thing and then I'll do some stop down stuff too obviously on a crop sensor that's an 80 millimeter equivalent so not very wide not very normal um, and then after that, I'll slap on the 90 millimeter and get some, some macro. I want to see how sharp that is on the R7. So that's the plan. Rock on. What a pretty little tableau of vintage manual focus lenses. But anyway, this is the Canon 50 millimeter f1.4. So I want to show you the, what, I talk, what I was talking about with the adapter. A little weird. So FD mount has this ring. Hopefully I can do this one-handed. Um, and that's what holds the lens onto the camera. Instead of turning and twisting, like most bayonet mounts, um, you put the lens on and then tighten this ring, and that clamps it down. So if I loosen this, cap comes off, uncapped. I've got the adapter on the camera already. So I'm lining up the red. 
and then you turn this once you get it situated see it's a little little fidgety we just got to uh or maybe it was or maybe it's this pin see that's what i'm talking about there see the pin inside there it's got this ring on the adapter that moves sorry this is so shaky uh, moves that pin back and forth so i think i need to put it on in lock mode maybe yeah then the lens goes on then you can switch that back to open mode and then when we stop down the aperture it actually works whereas if this is in lock mode whatever that means the aperture does nothing so something to keep in mind when you're if if you happen to go the fd route but wow that's a nice aperture isn't it i love it <laughs> okay let's see what this thing can do I found a spot with some vegetation, even though it's all wintry and kind of in decay. Um, but that's pretty too, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the 90 millimeter and see what I can do with that. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention though, and as far as the benefits of using these lenses on mirrorless cameras, most mirrorless cameras have IBIS in body image stabilization, where the sensor moves to keep things steady. That's a big help. Um, because obviously none of these lenses have any electronics, so they don't have IS. Um, and that means if you can slap them on a body with image stabilization, boom, you've got a stabilized lens. And that's great for video. It's great for hand-holding slow shutter speeds. It's not as good as when you have both lens and body stabilization that are working together, like on the new uh, Canon RF IS lenses and these bodies. But it's still better than nothing, which is what I had before. So, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, so when I'm using the 90, I think I'm going to slap it at generally f4 to f8. Keep it in that range and uh, see how it goes. Maybe I'll do one or two wide open just to test that sharpness on the R7. But generally, with a macro, you want to stop down anyway. I've got a little uh, my little pocket LED light that I can use if I want to shed some extra light on a subject. So I'll see what I see that's worth shooting. Probably just some leaves and decayed flowers and stuff. But it might be pretty. See what we get see how sharp it is <laughs> all right so here is the 90 millimeter on the r7 um, like i said before i'm basically just going to set this lens at its closest focusing distance um, and move the camera in and out to focus so i want to get full magnification that's the way to do that um, i'm at 2.5 f-stop right now i'll leave it there for the first few stops and then i'll, I'll drop it down probably go all the way up to 11 just to I know I said F4 to F8, but we'll test it out thoroughly on the R7 here, just in this general area, which let me show you. Oops, wrong flip. Hold on. <laughs> show you where I am. So got some, uh, yeah, old vegetation with some seed pods that might be interesting. I saw some leaves and over there's a bush with some flowers, kind of, that might be okay. And some moss, stuff like that. We'll just see what we can find in this general area and on the way back. Oh, there's a little bit of green over there. I'll see if that's anything good. Okay, on we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
really different shooting with manual lenses. <laughs> Definitely feeling the lack of IS, image stabilization. I kind of hold my breath quite a bit <laughs> when I'm shooting. As the in-body helps, but it's still not quite the same, especially when you're working macro. Things are close. Yeah. But that's why it's a challenge. And for the price, that's kind of the, the budget option, what you got to keep in mind, too. Um, as, yeah, I'm not sure what these lenses are going for these days. Um, when I picked them up, I usually didn't spend more than 50 bucks, maybe 75 if it was one I really wanted. Um, these days are probably more than that. I don't know. Depends on the lens, I'm sure. There's still a few on my wish list, actually, that I didn't pick up back in the day. I would love to get a Jupiter 9 85mm f2, uh, which is another Soviet knockoff of a Zeiss lens, the Zeiss Sonar. Yeah, um, there's a... Speaking of Zeiss, they made a Flectagon 24mm f2.4, which would be excellent in M42 mount. Um, and then that Tamarin 17mm I opened. Those are really the, the three that I would like to have primes. It'd be fun to play with. I hear that uh, the Jupiter has a lot of character too. And that reminds me, I didn't try my Helios. Ooh. On the way back, I'm going to slap on the Helios and try to get some shots to show you. It's really the bokeh on that one that gives it distinctive character. So I'll put that on real quick and grab a few shots where I can show you what I'm talking about on that one. In fact, I see a little subject over there that I can get, okay, um, before I head out of Belle Isle, Dry Rocks, and on to the next destination. So, hope we're having fun so far. Stay tuned. So now that I've gotten the photos back home and edited and uh, been able to look at them a little more closely on the computer, I wanted to give a quick rundown on the sharpness and overall image quality. So uh, the first thing I want to say is that the images that I'm showing in this video are all edited. I don't really like to show anything straight out of camera. I like to give you the idea of what's possible with a little bit of tweaking. So keep that in mind. I haven't really cropped anything, but I've certainly edited, uh, you know, contrast and color saturation and, and all that good stuff. So keep that in mind. Um, as far as conclusions though, I will say these lenses aren't as sharp as modern lenses. And that's really because they didn't have to be. So on 35 millimeter film, um, the equivalent megapixel count is about 15 megapixels in terms of the grain size of the film and you know the detail that it can capture so these lenses didn't have to resolve to 30 or 45 megapixels or 61 if you're using a sony um yeah so keep that in mind they're still reasonably sharp decently sharp i'm hoping the results that i'm showing you are showing that um, but yeah if you pixel peep you're going to see some softness and some chromatic aberration and that sort of thing so keep that in mind too. But in terms of uh, the range between like plastic lenses on one hand and modern RF glass, L glass especially, on the other hand, they're closer to the L glass end <laughs> than the plastic end. So decent sharpness, reasonable sharpness, certainly usable images, I think is what I'm showing here. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. They're fun to play with, definitely. Um, you got to expect some misses. You've got to expect some sharp uh, softness, a little bit of softness, but um, Overall, good stuff and fun. <laughs>
This is Richmond City Hall. I don't know that I've been here before. <laughs> anyway, it's been a good day. Saw a bunch of cool stuff. Did some cool walking. Tried out these lenses on these new cameras. See how that comes out. But for now, I'm gonna go home. I'm starving, I skipped lunch. I should never skip lunch. <laughs> so yeah, heading to the car, go home, see what kind of pictures I got. Get them edited, probably not today. <laughs> and we'll get a video for you guys. <clears throat> Hope this has been useful. If you guys have any questions about these vintage lenses, how to use them, where to get them, I don't know. Maybe I can help. <laughs> um, yeah, let me know. In the meantime, be kind to yourself and each other. There was a high school here. Who knew? Uh, yeah, don't forget to be awesome. Get out and wander. Later. <laughs>